You may be seated. We welcome you to Metro Tab on this last Sunday morning of August, the eighth month, the month of new beginnings. The clock is ticking. The prophetic clock of the Lord is ticking rapidly. We started a series a few weeks ago talking about these last days that we are living in. And really it is a reality check because a lot of our culture and a lot of our world, even in the U.S., even in the Bible Belt, people don't know what's happening. They just know the world is in a mess. We're in trouble. But according to Scripture, these are prophetic days. These are difficult last days. And the signs of the times are very evident if you read the Bible. Turn to somebody and say, just read the Bible. If you just read the Bible, it's very clear where we are. And... These messages, this series that we're doing, it is not meant to scare you or frighten you or trouble you or I'm not trying to be a, how do they used to say it, hellfire and brimstone preacher? That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to scare anybody. But I do want you to know and to be aware, to know what these last days are and what's going to happen in these last days. We started a few days ago and we talked, as we said, about the end times. Revelation 1-8 is kind of a foundation verse. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The word Alpha means the first. Omega is the last. I am the first and the last. The beginning and the end. I am the one who is, always was, and who is still to come. God is. He just is. He exists. He has, he is, and he always will be. He says, the Almighty One. And as we look at this series, I want to give you a recap from the last several weeks as we've talked about what's going to happen and what is happening. The first real step-up event, I guess we could say, is going to be the rapture of the church. Now, the word rapture is not a word that we find in the Bible, but it is the word that theologians have used, and I'm not one. I try to be a well-studied student, but I'm not a theologian. But the theologians say that the rapture is the term that they use to describe when Jesus comes back for his bride. He is the bridegroom. He is coming for his bride, the church, the church of Jesus Christ. And the church is described as those people who have been born again. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus went and asked the question of Jesus, how can I be saved? How can I know you? And Jesus said, except you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And being born again is a spiritual experience where we repent of our sins and we invite Christ into our life and we literally have a born-again experience or to make it more clear, I guess we could say, it's transformation of life. You can say 10,000 prayers, but if your life is not changed, those are just words. And we say the sinner's prayer. Oftentimes we will do a sinner's prayer at the close of a service. But if you don't have a life transformation, you've just said some words. Jesus wants us to be transformed. When you become a Christian, your life is changed. Jesus said it like this, old things are passed away, all things are brand new. So that's what happens. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, this is the verse that really calls or describes this rapture, this catching away. And it says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Hey! And then it says, the trumpet of God shall sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain, we shall be caught up. And that's where we get that word rapture. We shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. 
That's what's going to happen when the rapture takes place. Jesus is coming back for his church. And he said, well, when is the rapture going to take place? Well, some theologians say he's going to come at the beginning of the tribulation. Some say he's coming halfway through the mid-trib folks. And then there are some that say he's coming at the end of the tribulation, the post-trib folks. As I told you a few weeks ago, I don't know what you believe, but I'm a pre-trib. I'm going to get out of here on the first load. Amen. <clears throat> if, you want, if you want to stay uh, through the tribulation, help yourself. Just don't take the mark of the beast if you stay, because you are doomed for hell if you do. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going with the first load. Revelation 3.10 is at the beginning of the tribulation. And if you read that verse, it says, He will keep us. Chapters 1, 2, and 3, the church is still mentioned and seen. As a matter of fact, he talks about the different churches in Revelation 1, 2, and 3. In verse 10 of chapter 3, he says, But I'm going to keep you or deliver you from that hour, that time of temptation and trouble that's going to come to the whole world. And then after that verse... You don't see the church in Revelation all the way until you get to the end of the book. So from chapter 3 on, all the way up to around 19 or 20, you don't see anything until Jesus comes back with his army to fight at the end. So the rapture takes place, then the tribulation begins, and you say, well, what happens to us? Well, during the tribulation, those that are saved, those born-again folks that we just talked about, they're going to be snatched out or raptured out. We're going to heaven, and we're going to spend seven years eating. Amen. We're going to have a party. How many like to eat? Oh, I know I was in the right place now. <clears throat> There's going to be a seven-year what the Bible calls the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb of God. He is the bridegroom. We as the church, all believers around the world on planet Earth are going to be caught up, and we're going to have a seven-year marriage supper feast. We're going to have food and fellowship, and we're just going to be rejoicing while the world is down here going through hell. That's the tribulation. Now, the last half of the tribulation is called, the Bible calls it the Great Tribulation, because the first half of the tribulation is basically going to be a peaceful time. Because when the rapture takes place, then the Antichrist is going to come on the scene. And when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's going to present himself as God or as the Messiah. And the Jewish people that have been looking for him for over 2,000 years to come and set up his kingdom on earth, they're going to accept him as the Messiah, as God, because he's going to have power. He's going to do supernatural acts. He's going to call fire from heaven. One of the greatest things that he will do is he's going to bring world peace. The economy will collapse, and that could happen any time. When the, when the dollar collapses, just get ready. Just say that you heard it here at Metro Tab, because the economy is going to collapse. The U.S. dollar is going to collapse, and when it collapses, the rest of the world economy is going to collapse. There's going to be a power play by Asia to bring a one-world currency. They already have one ready. There's going to be a power play. The Mediterranean countries, there are seven of those already that have their own currency. The European common market, there's already a number of nations in the, in the European common market that have what they call the euro. That is their dollar where all these different countries have come together. They use the same currency. I told you a few weeks ago, there's already a currency. They say that it's printed. I haven't seen it, but they call it the Amero, which will be used by Canada, the United States, Mexico, and some of the other countries in Latin America. And it's called the Amero for the Americas, North and South America. And at some point, the dollar will collapse, and there'll be a vying of power for this. But the Antichrist is going to bring a one-world government, and he'll bring peace. All these wars and all these things that have been taking place that we read about in Matthew chapter 24, there's going to be peace. This Antichrist is going to bring world peace. And when he brings world peace, everybody's going to say, hey, he's great. Let's follow him. And he's also going to establish a one-world currency that will be used anywhere around the world. It's been great when I've been able to travel to other countries and not have to change my dollars for their currency because they would accept dollars in those countries, and many countries have. But when this takes place, there'll only be one currency for the whole world. There'll be one leader for the whole world. All the nations of the world will follow him. He will do power he will, or do supernatural things with power. He'll, I don't know if he'll raise people from the dead. I don't know what he's going to do, but he's going to have so much power that people will follow him. And he has world peace. But halfway through the tribulation, things are going to change. He's going to set up an image of himself, an idol, 
in the temple in Jerusalem to be worshipped. And when he does that, the Jews are going to remember the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, where, he's, where the Bible said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and thou shalt not bow down and worship any graven image. And when that happens, when he sets up this image of himself to be worshipped, all hell's going to break loose. They are going to recognize that he is not Jesus, he is not the Messiah, he is Antichrist, he is not God. And when that happens, then the next three and a half years are going to be the Great Tribulation. And as we talked about it a few weeks ago, people will try to die, they'll try to commit suicide, try to kill themselves, they won't be able to die. They'll run to the mountains and want the mountains to fall on them and they won't be able to die. They'll shoot themselves, but they'll live, they'll survive it, they may be maimed. But they won't die. The spirit of death will be taken from the world. And there will be seven, uh, from chapter 8 in Revelation on up to about chapter 16 or 17, there are seven plagues or seven bowls or vials of uh, plagues that are going to be poured out. There will be all kinds of things. The water will turn to blood. There will be locusts that will be coming everywhere. But they'll have tails like scorpions and they'll sting people and bite them. And there will be all kinds of trouble. And again, I'm not telling you this to scare you or frighten you, because if you're born again, you're going to be raptured out. If you're a preacher, I mean, you're going on the first load with me and Jesus. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, then the mark of the beast is going to be given, because somewhere during this tribulation period, the, uh, the Antichrist is going to cause everybody to have this mark, which is his mark. It's called the mark of the number of the beast, and you've heard it before, 666. And yesterday, somebody say yesterday. Yesterday. In the headlines of Fox News yesterday, there was a, a little thing. I pulled this up off the Internet. It says, is there a microchip implant in your future? Can you see that? They have to pull those down just a moment and put that up so you can see that. Is there a microchip implant in your future? We talked about this the other day. Can you see that? All right, I'll stay where I am. Let them just adjust it. Can you see that? Somebody look at your neighbor and say, not from me. But this is likely the way that they're going to give the mark of the beast. It's a, it's a microchip about the size of a grain of rice. It will hold all of your computer information. You won't be able to buy or sell. You won't be able to buy gas, make a house payment, make a car payment. You won't be able to receive any kind of money without this chip. And the experts are saying that it... The Bible says it will be in the right hand or the forehead. The, uh, the experts that are in this computer technology say that for some reason, this chip that they've already got, they've already experimented with in several countries, with dogs, with animals, and now with people, it only works in the right hand. If they put it in the left hand, for some reason it won't work. Well, I'll tell you why, because the Bible said it's going to be in the right hand. And we, we can talk more about that, which we did a few weeks ago. So if you weren't here, you can get the DVD or the CD, and you can listen to it again. I'm just trying to give you a quick recap. So here's, here's one piece of information you don't want to miss. God forbid, if you are left here during the tribulation, if you backslide or if you're not saved and you, and you miss the rapture, whatever you do, don't take the mark of the beast. Because if you do, the Bible teaches that you will be doomed for an eternity in hell. So whatever you do, don't take that. I pray you're not here. But uh, there will be millions of people saved during the tribulation. The Bible says there will be 12,000 Jews from all 12 tribes of Israel, 144,000 Jews. Some theologians think that those 12 or those 144,000 Jewish people will actually become evangelists to win the law. So uh, likely that millions of people will be saved during the tribulation. But you, you have insight. You already know this. You're hearing this now. Most of you not for the first time. So if you can't make it here now, with the Holy Spirit here to help us, you won't make it then. Some will make it, but those will be the ones that never heard this. They didn't know this, and they find out, and people are being saved, and they'll, they'll just hold out so they can be saved. But many people are going to be lost. So the Antichrist comes on the scene. He gives the mark of the beast, and then we're going to move forward, and we're going to talk about today the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon will take place at the end of this seven-year tribulation. This seven-year tribulation, as I said, the first three and a half years approximately will be peaceful. The last three and a half, it's going to be terrible, terrible, terrible. And it's for the whole world. It's not a mid-eastern mid thing. It's not a regional thing. As we read two weeks ago, the Bible says it's for the whole world, those that are left here. 
And what happens in the battle of Armageddon? Well, in Israel, there is a valley. I've been there. I've looked over this valley. It's a huge, huge valley, and it's called Megiddo. And during this battle, the nations of the world are coming together to fight. And it's going to be a terrible battle. It's called the Battle of Armageddon. They've tried to make some movies about it, but they're, most of those are not spiritually or scripturally or biblically accurate by any means. But at the, the end time, the end of tribulation, this battle is going to take place. And that's when Jesus comes back for the second coming. The rapture, he comes back that we talked about in Revelation 3.10. But in Revelation 16, it says, The demonic spirits gathered all the rulers and their armies to, to a place with the Hebrew name Armageddon. And then in Revelation 19, watch this. Then, and this is uh, John on the Isle of Patmos given this revelation. You can see some parallel to this in, from Daniel in the Old Testament. Then I saw heaven opened. And a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True. Can you guess who that is? That's Jesus. He's coming back as the white horse rider. And his eyes were like flames of fire, and his head, on his head were many crowns. He wore a, a robe dipped in blood, and his title, his name, was the Word of God. The armies of heaven followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod or with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, shouting to the vultures flying high in the sky, Come! Gather together for the great banquet God has prepared. Come and eat the flesh of kings, generals, and strong warriors, of horses and their riders, and of all humanity. This is what's going to happen at the end in that valley of Megiddo. As a matter of fact, they are expecting from the Bible, the Bible teaches that it's going to be about a 200-mile-long piece of ground, and the blood is going to, there's going to be so many people killed during this time that the blood will actually flow to the horse's bridles. Can you imagine how much blood or how many people would have to be killed for that? Because the average adult has about six quarts of blood in his body. So how many would it take, how many would die during this great battle of Armageddon for there to be 200 miles long of blood flowing as high as the horse's bridles? Reading on, then I saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. Why? Because these people have been left here during the tribulation. They've been deceived by the Antichrist. All these plagues have been poured out. I didn't talk about the two uh, witnesses that are going to be here. But uh, during this tribulation period, there's going to be two witnesses. And the Bible says... Uh, we don't know who they're going to be. Most likely one of them will be Elijah because he was taken up in a whirlwind. Some theologians think the other one is Enoch. It doesn't say. Some say it could be Moses. But there will be two witnesses from God. And during this time when all these plagues are being poured out, these witnesses are representing God, trying to get people saved. But because of the plagues, people are going to get mad. They're going to get angry. They can't kill themselves. They can't die. They'll be in pain. There'll be terrible, terrible things. The water's turned to blood. And all these things are happening. So they get very angry at these two witnesses. As a matter of fact, in the end, during the last time, these, uh, these witnesses are going to be killed. And they're going to lay on the street for three days. And when this happens, all the world is going to rejoice. It'll be on CNN and Fox and all the news channels. They'll see it around the world and they'll rejoice. They will not be buried. They'll lay dead in the street for three days because it's been so chaotic. And everybody's glad and rejoicing that's left. But then... The Spirit of God will come back in them, and they're going to be raised from the dead. And when they see that, and the Bible talks about the whole world will see them. How will that happen? Through satellite television. Of course, that's not a new thing to us. I remember, I shouldn't say this, but I remember when we uh, only had three television channels. And I was the one that, when my daddy wanted to change the channel, I had to get up and go and turn it. And now everybody sits back in that remote, and they go through 200 channels. But through satellite television, through the technology, through the internet, the whole world will see these witnesses laying on the street. But God's going to raise them from the dead. 
And so we saw here that the beast, the kings of the world, their armies gathered together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Their entire army, their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding the white horse and all and the vultures all gorged themselves on the dead bodies we used to take a tour every about every two years we would take 20 to 40 people to israel we went for many years and we would take people to the holy land and let them see where jesus walked and tell the stories and it makes the bible come alive as we used to go and we would go to the valley of megiddo our guide which we use basically the same one every time he started telling us about these huge vultures that we would see in the valley of megiddo they have a 14 foot arm uh, wingspan and up until just before that time he would say he would tell us that these vultures uh, the female would only lay one egg every couple of years and sometimes they would only have one offspring every two to five years at least every two to three years but recently he told us that they have started having laying two and three eggs at one time which was completely against the grain of their normal activity And sometimes it was not just once a year, but maybe even twice a year. And the vultures were everywhere. You were starting to see more and more of these huge 14-foot wingspan vultures. Why? Because God's getting them ready to clean up that mess that's going to take place in that battle in Megiddo. Does that make any sense? And it's amazing how our forefathers put a lot of thought into this country. If you go to Washington, D.C., you see that the mall is laid out in, a, in the shape of a cross. You see on the Washington Monument, at the very top of the Washington Monument, there is a plaque with Scripture on it. If you go around to the Lincoln Memorial and you go to all the other memorials, you'll find Scriptures and you'll find foundational verses about how this country was established on religious freedom. And it was biblical principles that brought us to where we are today. Even in a song that most of us are familiar with called the Battle Hymn of the Republic, That verse, or that hymn, came from these verses of Scripture. And here are the words, and it's from Revelation 19. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Our God is marching on. When I was in high school, that was the fight song for the football team and the band played that when we had a touchdown and the trumpets would get to the end his truth is marching on I didn't know then but that battle hymn of of the Republic which we use kind of as a patriotic hymn and song for America. Glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching on. It is about the battle of Armageddon. When Jesus comes back, when it says, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. That speaks of the blood spill in that battle in the valley of Armageddon. Glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching on. Did you know that? What happens after the battle of Armageddon? Well, the next thing is the millennial reign because the battle takes place at the end of this seven-year tribulation. And then there's going to be a millennial reign. What is a millennial? What is a millennium? A millennium is 1,000 years. So at the end of the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon takes place. Jesus comes back on a white horse as the white horse rider. He defeats all the enemies of Satan, the the, the beast, the false prophet, the dragon, cast him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, and this millennial reign starts. Here it is, Revelation 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil, Satan 
and bound him in chains for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. So he locks him up. Somebody say, shut him up. That devil that has tempted and tormented and frustrated the people of God and the people of the earth for so long, he's going to be shut up for 1,000 years. Afterward, watch this, afterward, he must be released for a little while. Why? Because during this 1,000-year millennium, Jesus is going to set up his kingdom on the earth and we are going to be here with him, and he will rule and reign the earth. But during those thousand years, can you imagine how many people will be born in a thousand years? So people will be born. Jesus will be ruling. It will be peaceful. There won't be sin. There won't be all the temptation, all the problems, because the tempter has been put in a pit. So at the end of that time, he's going to be released for a little while to tempt those people. Here it is in Revelation 7 through 10, chapter 27 through 10. When the thousand years come to an end, Satan will be let out of his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations. Then he's going to be thrown into that fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. Can I translate? We win. We win. You, you don't hear this a whole lot, but I think we need to know this is what's going to happen. These are the way the events unfold. And we get so caught up in our little world sometimes that we fail to remember that there is a battle, a war going on between good and evil. Amen. Now, please understand that the powers are not equal. Right. Satan and his evil is not equal to the power of God. I know we ask questions and we've had people ask questions. Well, if God is so good, why did he create a devil? And how much power does the devil have? It seems like he has more power than God sometimes. No. He has limited power, limited ability, and his days are drawing short. His time is running out. He's working as hard as he ever has or harder than he ever has because he knows his time is about to run out. But he's going to be bound for a thousand years. So what happens after that thousand years? He's loose for a little while, and then there's going to be judgment. Somebody say judgment. Did you know that we're going to be judged for our deeds, for what we do? We talked about, a, about living in a dispensation of grace or a season of grace, which is what we are in right now. The grace of God covers us. If we repent, God forgives us. He covers our sins with the blood that he shed on Calvary. If you're sick... He heals you by his blood that was shed on Calvary. But then the white throne judgment is going to take place. Let's read about that. Chapter 20, we went to verse 10. Now let's go to verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were opened, including the book of life. I hope your name is written in that book. Amen. It has to be there on Judgment Day. It should be there now, but it has to be there then. You don't want it blotted out. Let me just put in a commercial right here and mess up some of your theology. Some folks think that if they got saved when they were 7 or 9 or 12 or 25 or 50 and were baptized, then they're good. You've got to live for God. Just saying a prayer is not enough. You've got to live for Him. Don't let me mess up your theology now, but the Bible talks about he will blot some out out of the book. I'm opening a can of worms here. I don't have time to work on right now. I'll come back later on that. Let's look at it. I saw a great white throne. He was sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the, both, the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done. Mm. So our deeds do matter, don't they? Oh, I said a prayer one time. I'm saved. But if you're living like the devil, you're going to be judged according to what you have done as recorded in the books because he's keeping, you know, we sing that song, you better watch out, you better not cry, you better not pout, I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. He knows when you've been good, knows when you've been bad. 
Santa Claus don't know. But Jesus knows. And he's got a recorder, and he's putting it in the books. And he said, you're going to be judged according to what you are done, have done as recorded in the books. He's keeping notes, folks. The sea gave up its dead, and the death and the grave gave up their dead. And all, hmm, does that get all of us? All were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Let me just tell you. Let me just be serious. Let me be strong. You've got to be saved. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the only way. He's the only way. I know there are folks that will tell you, Oh, there are many paths to heaven. There are many paths to God. Believe that if you want to. Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other. I don't mean to be so hard. I don't mean to make you mad. I just want you to know. And you ought to be, you ought to be taking notes on this so you can share it with your family and your friends. As a matter of fact, get all the DVDs of the series. We give them away. Get the CDs. Get the DVDs. Put it in a packet. Put it in a box. Put if you're left in the rapture and put it on that and give that to family and friends that you know that are not saved. If you're, le if you're left here, they need to open it then. Open, in case of rapture, open. Because we're going to be gone. You won't be able to tell them then. So they can open up, they can listen to these CDs and watch the DVDs and see what's going to happen, read the scripture and know what's coming. Because the first three and a half years are going to be peaceful. This Antichrist comes on the scene and they're going to say, oh, this is good. Wish my family were here. I don't know where, where they went. They disappeared. Well, it's not going to be good after a few years. It's going to get worse. So let's read on. After, after, the, uh, after the rapture, the tribulation, all this happens, the battle of Armageddon, the, uh, the millennial reign, a thousand years, because we're going to reign with him a thousand years, then the great white throne judgment, then what? Then I'm going to mess up your theology again. A new heaven and a new earth is coming. Where is heaven? Where is heaven? We talk about heaven being up there somewhere, above and beyond the clouds. And did you know that even the astronomers will say, the Bible says that the Lord's throne is in the north. The, astron the astronomers will tell you through their big telescopes that there is a corridor in the north part of our galaxy, and it's so big and so deep, they can't tell where it goes. It's where the throne of God is. I could really mess your theology up some more, but we don't have time. But the, the, the new heavens and the new earth, let me just, let's just read it in the scripture. This is not me. I'm giving you Bible. In Revelation 3.10, here's what he says. Hold on to what you have. Hold on to your faith. Hold on to your belief. Hold on to your trust in God. Hold on to Jesus. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. Read on. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God. The new Jerusalem. What is the new Jerusalem? It's the city of our God. They're going to be citizens there. We're going to be citizens there in the city of our God. The new Jerusalem that what? That comes down from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. When you become born again, he gives you a new name. The Bible says he writes it on a white stone. We used to sing a song. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. Some of y'all don't remember that, and I'm telling my age. <laughs> but he's going to give us a new name, and we're going to be citizens of this new Jerusalem, this new city, the city of God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven, from God. Well, where is it going to come down to? Let's read on. Revelation 21, 8 reiterates this, reiterates this uh, beginning in verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. During the battle of Armageddon, it's going to be mess. It's going to be bad. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if nuclear bombs are going to happen, but the earth is going to be in such a mess, he's going to have to make it new. So he's going to bring down from heaven a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And here's what the writer said. 
I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. See, some of you thought we were going to go somewhere in the sky. We're going for seven years for that uh, marriage supper of the Lamb. Then the new Jerusalem is coming here. We were made to be on earth. I know I'm messing your theology up, but it's right here. Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. Now watch this. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more sorrow. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There will be no more pain. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. He also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. Wow. Does that help anybody? And all who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. This is what's going to happen. After the white throne judgment, he's going to set up his kingdom on earth like the Jews have been looking for for all these years. He's going to set up his kingdom, and we're going to live with him forever. But the cowards, the unbelievers, the corrupt, the murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and most liars... Oh, did I miss that one? Hello? He's not here. Oh, did I hit somebody then? Don't mean to be mean, but we talk about big lies and little lies. A lie is a lie is a lie. If it's not true, it's a lie. You better be careful what you say. It is quiet now. I'm still in the book. Let me just back up. We are reading Revelation. Revelation, where is it? Chapter 21. Rita can tell because when she was little, her dad caught her in a lie. He sat her down and made her read this scripture. We're in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. Let's get right over here. But the cowards, verse 8, but the cowards, the unbelievers, the corrupt, the murderers. So I'm none of those, the immoral. Mm. Those who practice witchcraft, oh, I would never do that. Idol worshipers, oh, I don't worship any other idols, they're just God. And all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Mm. This is the second death. But I have good news. In Joel chapter 2, here's what he says, sound the alarm. Turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. I will give you back what you lost. I will pour out my spirit on all people. That's happening now. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. That is happening now. Your old men will dream dreams. That is happening now. Your young men will see visions. That is happening now. I will pour out my spirit on men and women alike. That is happening now. There is a revival sweeping the globe. More people are being saved now than any other time in history. The Bible talks about a great falling away, and there's a separation come. The hotter getting hotter, and the colder getting colder. Which are you? But here's the good news. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. When you call on Him, if you believe that He is the Son of God, If you believe that Jesus died and rose again, you invite him into your heart and you pray and believe on him. Believe it in your heart. You're as saved as if you were already there. It's more than just words. It's more than just repeating somebody, repeating a sinner's prayer after somebody. That's great. We need to do that. But it must be real. It must come from your heart. And when you get saved, the truth and the proof that you have gotten saved is there will be a life change. 
You stop doing what you used to do because you're going to be judged by your deeds. You stop going where you used to go. You stop saying the kind of things you used to say. You start talking different. You start acting different. You start looking different. Will you mess up? Sure. You're human. You're going to fall. You're going to stump your toe. You may mess up, but when you do, don't quit and backslide just because you messed up one time. Get up. Brush yourself off. Repent. Call on Him because you know you've done wrong. The Holy Spirit convicts us, and when He does, just repent and get back up on the wagon from where you fell off. Does that help anybody? And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. These are the last days, and I want you to make it. And I know the rapture is going to take place. It could be any time. You say, well, when, Pastor? I don't know. The Bible says no man knows the day or the hour. We don't know. But the disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 24, how will we know the signs? Give us some signs. And we studied that a few weeks ago. So go home and read Matthew 24 and see if it doesn't depict what we are living in right now. We are living in last days. We are living in difficult times. War is on every hand. There's earthquakes. I just showed you the thing in Fox News yesterday about the implant of microchips. That's going to be the mark of the beast. That's the way it'll happen. It'll just slide in because it's so easy. You already go to the gas station and put your card in so you can get gas. You already go to the grocery store and every, everything's got these barcodes and they just beep, beep, beep. They pass it through and it's all easy. We've, we've come to accept it over the last 10 or 20 years or more. So it'll be just easy to have a little chip in your hand and when you get ready to pay, they run the barcode, they run it and you just stick your hand there, beep, and it just pulls it right out of your bank account. But you better not get that chip. You better not get that mark or you'll be lost. So what does all this mean for us? Here it is. I read the last page and we win. We win. It may get worse before it gets better, but you don't have to be afraid. This message was not meant to scare you. I'm just trying to tell you, here's where we are. I don't know when it's going to happen. It could be any time. It could be a while. But we know that God's got this. God's got this. So don't worry. Don't be afraid. Trust in Him. I wonder how many of you can lift your hand right now and say, Pastor, I'm saved. I'm ready to go to heaven. My life has been transformed. I'm not what I used to be. Just lift your hand as a testimony. Hallelujah. That's what it's all about. A life transformed by Him. I wonder how many would say, Pastor, I plan to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be lost. I don't want to be in the tribulation. I don't want to be left. I'm not sure I'm ready right now, so pray for me. If that's you, put your hand up. Say, Pastor, pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else should say, Pastor, that's me. Pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Pray for me. We're going to pray right now. Say, Pastor, pray for me. I plan to go to heaven. Don't want to go to hell. Thank you. I don't want to be lost. I'm just not sure I'm ready right now, to mo- this moment today. If you were to die right now, you've got to be ready. You ready to pray? Let's all pray this prayer. And mean it from our heart. Just say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I'm calling on you. Forgive me of all of my sins, of every deed, everything I've done wrong, every sin that separates me from you forgive me come into my heart fresh today and be the Lord of my life and start the transformation the life change in me I want to be your servant and from this moment forward I will serve you if I fall help me to get back up and to keep going Because I want to make it to heaven. And I want to take as many people as I can with me. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah.